All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to the adult Bible class. We are in church history once again in week 20, and we're going to be looking at the Council of Chalcedon or Chalcedon. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to say it. I'm going to say Chalcedon because that's how I learned it. Um, this is going to happen in the year 451, or this did happen in the year 451. After this week, we're actually going to rewind the clock, and we're going to go all the way back to 381, and we're going to pick up another thread. Uh, but we wanted to follow, you know, like the scent of these uh, heresies and these church councils uh, without getting too distracted by all the other things that were happening in history. So we're going to, like when you're painting, you, you know, you use all the yellow and then you do the brown and then the red. Or, you know, when you're um, uh, printing a, a picture that prints all the one color and then the next color. So, uh, or, or when you're knitting or uh, uh, what needlepoint or something, you do all the red thread and then the blue. So, so we've, uh, we're, we're near the end of the Christological heresies, uh, which are Trinitarian heresies in point of fact. The thing that's going to come next in church history uh, is salvation type his, uh, heresies. But to get there, we got to go back and pick up another thread. So uh, just be ready for that. This week will not be quite as heavy theologically as last week's was, uh, but we really needed to lay that groundwork and understand kind of what was going on in the minds of church leaders and, and congregation members, uh, because what we're going to see happen leading up to Chalcedon is um, shocking, really. Uh, so we so we had to have our, our feet uh, wet on that. So um, once again, we are looking at this idea of the hypostatic unit union. Hypostases was the word that was chosen to describe the personhood of Jesus, and in the personhood of Jesus are unified two natures: the nature of God and human nature. Uh, so here we are, we're looking at uh, the Council of Chalcedon, which kind of ends um, the uh, her heretical views of, of either the, the Godhead or uh, Christ as a person. Yes, sir. Uh, the, they would probably be in the room behind me. No worries. Uh, so, Council of Chalcedon. So, this is kind of the, the last um, ecumenical council. That means of the whole church. That both the Eastern Church and the Western Church, um, actually the Eastern Church are non-Chalcedonian. They, they do not subscribe to the Council of Chalcedon. And we're going to see that. Um, really, the break started at Ephesus. So as we get into the dividing church, we're going to be looking at guys like Ambrose of Milan, Jerome, Augustine, um, Western thinkers, and then we'll take a look at some of the Eastern thinkers. So that'll be next week. Let's pray and we'll get in. Father, I ask that you would keep our minds sharp and clear as we seek to understand how you moved through your church, how you have uh, sovereignly directed these things in spite of the sinfulness of man and our propensity to fall short of your glory or to intentionally um, deceive or smear your name, that we would see uh, that, that you are not lost, that your throne is still uh, solidly uh, ruling over the affairs of man, and, and that this study today would help us understand how we got our language to understand you and um, and really just grow us deeper in, in appreciation for the, the way that uh, people have loved you and, and sought to understand you uh, and, and motivate us, Father, to have those same uh, level of depth of thought that uh, we might raise and elevate our worship because our understanding of who you are and what you are and how you love and how you move is, is, is just so much deeper. And I ask this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 
Uh, I'm realizing now that I left one important resource off of here, which is from the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, which is a resource that's been on almost every slide. Um, and the, the resource is by Leo the First from, I believe, 400 to 460, maybe, was his uh, time as Bishop of Rome. Uh, when you pull it up, there's going to be Leo, and then, of course, they tag it with the Great, and Gregory the Great. But under Leo, you're going to want to find the letter to Flavius, commonly called the Tome, T-O-M-E. There's a bunch of letters that he's written that are available, but the one that is going to be most meaningful to the topic today is the one that is a letter to Flavius, and we'll talk about who Flavius is and why his tome is important. Uh, so the first video that I've linked is from a Coptic priest describing uh, their uh, similarities and differences. Coptic is an Eastern Orthodox branch of Christianity that split apart from the main church over the issue of how the unity of divinity and humanity comes together in Christ. They disagreed with the language that would be used at Chalcedon. Um, and we'll see the, the character they're following. Uh, Roger Olson, Chalcedon Protects the Mystery, chapter 15. It's a, a short but thorough uh, read. Uh, Protestant Talks is a, a channel I found um, recently, and I thought he had a very helpful description of the events uh, that were happening at the Council of Chalcedon. Uh, so if you would like to you know, understand a little more of what happened here, I recommend that. And of course, Ryan Reeves, uh, excellent Westminster Theological, no, Gordon Conwell School of Theology professor. So uh, helpful. We've got five topics that we're going to try to get through today. We're going to do a very uh, brief but hopefully clarifying overview of the first three councils that we have looked at, Nicaea, Constantinople, and first Ephesus. Then we're going to look at the situation in, in the church that led up to what is called the second council of Ephesus. Uh, it's also been called the robber synod. We're going to look at the events that happened at Ephesus 2, and we're going to very briefly consider Leo's tome. Uh, we're going to take a look then at what happened at the Council of Chalcedon, and we'll conclude today's lesson uh, with the definition that comes out of uh, the Council of Chalcedon that was all agreed to and signed, and then questions if we still have time. We'll have time. All right. The Council of Nicaea, the most important uh, changing event in the history of the church in the first 500 years, by no doubt, was this Council of Nicaea. This is where church and state, you remember, first uh, came together. And they said, we need to clarify how we understand the Trinity. We, we saw as we looked at the early church fathers that they had always believed in the divinity of Jesus. And we, we, we cited numerous examples in the, you know, the, the 300 years before Nicaea of, of statements that are clearly Trinitarian. But once it became legal to be a Christian and people weren't being persecuted and tortured, they now had time to meditate and dwell and think more deeply about what does this really mean. And, and as they dug into the mystery, they began to err and make mistakes in ways that their conclusion would be heretical. And one of those ways was a, a priest by the name of Arius. You remember Arius said that Jesus was the first and greatest thing God had ever created. But if that's the case, then he is not divine and we are not truly saved. And so the Council of Nicaea was brought together to to root out and refute this Arian heresy. And they did so uh, by using this Greek word, the same essence, homo usias. They also made political changes in the church. They established that the bishop 
of Rome, that the head bishop of Rome was responsible as a patriarch, as a pope of his Roman region. And they said that was because that was where the apostle Peter had set up the church. Now that is not, there's no evidence in scripture that Peter ever went to Rome, but there is church history that Peter went to Rome. There is evidence that Peter was in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem also was given this, this honorific uh, patriarchy, the Bishop of Jerusalem because of Peter's. And Antioch and Alexander both claim Mark as their uh, founding apostle. And so they got a bishopric also. And so that was established. And then we move on um, a few years after Nicaea to 381. And the issue of Arianism, although it was declared by the church to be heretical, was actually held to as the normative way of believing by many of the empirical rulers of Rome. And they were appointing bishops that held to Arian heresy. And so the church had to get together at the Council of Constantinople in 381. And they again stated that Jesus is homoousion. He is the same. But there, there was another Trinitarian heresy that came up that we just very briefly touched on. The spirit fighters. That's what that Latin, uh, Greek word pneumatomachianism means. Spirit fighters. Also called uh, Macedonians. And these people did not hold the Holy Spirit to be equally divine. And so Constantinople added words to the creed, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. And when you look at what's in the hymnal as the Nicene Creed, what you see is basically where the Bible talks about what the Holy Spirit has done, this creed affirms that work of the Spirit. And all of those works are only works God can do. So it affirms the godness of the Holy Spirit through the biblical testimony of his work. And that is how that creed defends the divinity of the Holy Spirit uh, was by adding that language to the creed. So uh, Arianism and church polity and then there, um, Constantinople. Uh, did I forget to? Yeah, I forgot to add the third line. What else happened at Constantinople? They added themselves politically, as a fifth bishopric, a fifth patriarchy. They said, we are the new Rome. And so they, they took Rome's claim to be, uh, you know, the head of the Roman province, and they said, that's true of us at Constantinople because we're the new Rome. But you see, what that did is it changed the reason Rome saw herself as important from being Peter's church to being the empire's capital. And so Rome was not happy with Constantinople making that claim that they were the fifth uh, C. The C is, is a chair, a seat, a place where uh, authority lies. And so Constantinople claimed that for herself. And then we saw at the Council of Ephesus in 431 that the nature of Jesus, how is he, if he is divine, as these first two councils have said, because there's one God and three persons, how do these two natures come together? And one of the ways of understanding that was uh, what Nestorius said, that there was a divine nature and a human nature. There was a, a divine person and a human person. And the two existed together and were unified, not in one person, but because they had the same will. They had the same moral standards. They had the same purpose. They worked for the same goal, but they never were really truly united as one person. Well, at the Council of Ephesus, they said, if that's the case, then the divine part wasn't actually on the cross paying for our sin, atoning for us. If that's the case, then um, the divine part wasn't living a righteous life that we would then get as our claim to righteousness, right? Put on the, the breastplate of righteousness. That's the righteousness of God. This is what John says when he says, test the spirits. Those who deny that Jesus has come in the flesh, right, are, are false teachers and antichrists. And that coming in the flesh, we, we saw in 1 John, had to do not with just the incarnation, 
but actually the testimony of the Spirit about what Jesus did when he was in the flesh, right? He, he did these works of righteousness that we get to claim. And so by claiming any other righteousness than the righteousness of Christ for our salvation, any other righteousness than the righteousness of Christ to escape the wrath of God, to add our works to that is to be a false teacher and an antichrist, right? So they were very concerned at this council to defend the union of the divine and the human. And so they defended that through this description of God-bearer, Theotokos, right? And the story is preferred Christotokos, but the East and the West did not come together. We remember at Ephesus, they, they convened that council without waiting for the Antiochian bishop, John of Antioch. And the Alexandrian bishop, Cyril, held this council apart from John of Antioch. So it took two years after that when basically the emperor, Theodosius, sat the two down in a room together and said, don't come out until you figure it out. And so they agreed to this formula of reunion in 433. And what that did was it said, okay, Nestorius is a heretic. He needs to be excommunicated. He needs to be exiled. And there are churches today that are Nestorian churches that thought Nestorius got a bad rap, that he was falsely accused of heresy because he actually agreed with the formula of reunion. Yet he, he is, you know, charged with heresy and he was excommunicated. And the other thing is that they had to declare that there were two natures in Jesus. But Cyril continued to teach that there was one nature in Christ. That after the incarnation, the two natures became one nature. Now he would teach that in such a way as to not cross a line uh, that, that he had... Um, then became heretical, but the people that follow him would push past that line. And pushing past that line of the one natureness is what's going to ultimately require this council of uh, Chalcedon. Oh, so um, there we go. Ephesus 431 added the Constantinople as a patriarch. That was wrong. That should have been on the Constantinopolian uh, council. So put that in the the other category if you're taking notes. Um, the underlying issue in all of this was not really to understand the Trinity. It wasn't really to understand the incarnation of Jesus. What it was, was trying to make sure that whatever we say about the Trinity, whatever we say about the person and nature of Jesus does not undermine uh, salvation. Um, Roger Olson in his History of Christian Theology has this paragraph, and I thought it was important for us to understand what's at stake here, especially as we look at what happens leading up to the Council of Chalcedon, that we understand the stakes. We understand what everybody has, you know, kind of in the pot in this, this argument, this disagreement, he writes, just as bitter and divisive as the earlier one. This is, he's writing this about the Council of Chalcedon was about the nature of the God-man, Jesus Christ. As always, that was the surface issue. Beneath the surface, wrangling over proper terminology for describing his person and being, lay vastly different ideas of salvation. Jesus Christ's importance was as Savior of the world. Everyone are agreed that in order to accomplish salvation, he had to be truly God and truly human. Representatives of Antioch and Alexandria both felt the other side was continuing to express the doctrine of the incarnation in ways that undermined or even subtly destroyed Jesus Christ's ability to save. The conviction was that if the wrong doctrine set in and became universal, the gospel itself would be changed. So this is, this is a very important issue in the life of the church, even though it does seem arcane, it seems um, very, you know, high-minded and, and, and uh, uh, what do they call the ivory towers of academia. This was, this was raging in the streets. And so the Antiochian theology portrayed Jesus as divine example rather than healer. Okay, they, they, they uh, 
Alexandrian theology, however, portrayed the saving work of Jesus as only a function of the divine logos, exclusive of his humanity. They gave all the credit to the God divinity of Jesus and, and they didn't want to see the humanity of Jesus play a role because, because that would taint the divinity of, if God was somehow actually human and changeable and mutable, right, and could actually die, what kind of God is that? Right? So they wanted to give all the saving credit to the divinity, but the Antiochene uh, was, was jealous to protect the humanity of Jesus because they understood that it is humanity that needed to be uh, uh, saved. But they saw it as a, a work of healing or example setting. So Antioch, um, th this is setting the stage for what's going to follow or what, what should follow, which is a more clear understanding of salvation uh, but Rome is crumbling. Um, this council is 451. What happened in 410? Alaric, the Visigoth, sacked Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire in the West. This, this Visigoth, this German guy, comes down, you know, burns some things, kills some people, pokes around, and says, well, I'm not staying here. I'm going back. But he sacks Rome for the first time in the history, you know, like thousand years, this proud empire, their capital city is invaded. And, and they couldn't do anything about it, right? Their legions were powerless. So, you know, Rome is falling at this time. So what, what should have been the natural next move, which would have been uh, understanding salvation, um, society in general goes into what we call the dark ages, right? The, the, the medieval period because of this. So there isn't a whole lot of theology going on when you're worried about, uh, will I have enough food for me or my children, right? And so you're not sitting in, in the city enjoying life and thinking heavy thoughts. Uh, but at this time, Antioch had received a guy from Rome by the name of Pelagius. Um, when you see that name, Pelagius, you should hear boos and hisses in your mind like, like the New York Giants were here, right? Or the Ohio State Buckeyes, right? Like just boo, evil, hiss, bad, Pelagius. Pelagius uh, was a heretic that believed salvation was at least in part a work of humanity. Uh, Antioch received this guy from the West and they were giving refuge to him because his view of this high view of humanity's ability to participate in the saving work itself very much aligned with the humanity of Jesus being a part of how we were saved as the example setter for us. And so they, they had him. Uh, and what this did is this gave um, Alexandria and Rome a reason to be united together against Antioch, right? Alexandria, the bishop there, saw this as an opportunity, the enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing, right? So, so there's this political thing that's going on. And at the Council of Ephesus 1, one of the things that had to be stated in order for Rome to agree with Ephesus 1, let me pause as we were talking about Ephesus 1, remember Cyril, the bishop of Antioch, sent a letter to the bishop of Rome saying, hey, can you believe what's going on in Antioch? This is what they're saying. That can't be right, can it? Don't you agree with me and my position in Alexandria? And the Roman pope, the bishop of Rome, was like, yeah, I'm the man. Look at these guys writing to me, getting me you know, so this is the first time that happened that somebody expressed to Rome this, you know, higher view of, of there. Uh, so in order for them then to sign on with the decrees of Ephesus, they wanted to make sure that Pelagius uh, was condemned. So they got rewarded for their involvement in Ephesus. They got rewarded for being that third party that was called in to be an arbiter because they got their way about, and it was right, right? Pelagius should be condemned, boo hiss bad guy, right? But, but you can see this, this beginnings of now when we look at the Roman Catholic Church and they have this like, you know, huge view of the Bishop of Rome. Um, this is where it starts. 
This is the, the historical movement that, that it comes on. In fact, we're going to see the Council of Chalcedon. The Bishop of Rome doesn't even go. He doesn't even agree with it. What he does is he writes a separate letter afterwards restating everything that was agreed to at Chalcedon as the orthodox view and says, I'm the Bishop of Rome. This is how it is. Although all he did was repeat what was decided at the Council of Chalcedon. But, you know, it, it further um, divided himself politically from, as the head of the rest of the church. So we get done with Ephesus and there's still this unsettled question about the free will. How did the humanity of Jesus actually participate in the saving work? What happened in the desert when Satan said, if you are really divine, turn this stone into bread. Or if you will bend the knee and worship me, I'll give you all of that. You know, what really happened? Was the humanity of Jesus actually tempted? Did he, in his human will, in his human nature, long to commit sin but resist? Or was it that the divine nature, the, the logos, was so powerful that no matter what Jesus wanted in his humanity, he couldn't have sinned? This is the question, because if Jesus could not have sinned, then his human nature did not get tempted, and he is not like us in every way. As Cyril would say, only what was taken up is redeemed, by, taken up in the flesh by God. So if our human will wasn't taken up by Jesus on the cross, our human will was not redeemed at the cross. Well, Cyril, the bishop of Alexander, dies in 444. And his replacement is a guy by the name of Dioscorus. Dioscorus is a jerky McJerkface. He is, he is the worst. He is, he is the guy that when you're going to the, you know, watch the movies, he's always there with his asthma inhaler at all the, you know, critical moments. Right, like ruining it for everybody. This is Dioscorus, right? Um, Olson writes about him in his history of uh, Christian theology. Few men in church history have been as universally disdained and scorned as this character. That's not high praise. So keep this in mind. Dioscorus was adamant because Cyril was teaching this and Dioscorus is going to take it and ratchet it up to the point of heresy about this one nature theology and ardently opposed to the two nature view that Antioch holds to. Antioch actually gives preference to the human nature side. Well, up in Antioch, we have this, this theologian by the name of Theodoret of Cyrus who was writing letters in opposition to the teaching of Dioscorus. He, Theodoret of Cyrus, this, this theologian in Antioch, saw the formula of reunion as a great victory for Antioch because it affirmed the two natures. Remember, the, the Nestorius is condemned because he divided the two natures into two persons. And... The two natures was reaffirmed, even though Cyril secretly had his you know, fingers crossed behind his back about the whole thing. By the way, he was teaching, well, well Dioscorus notches it up, and now Theodoret has to respond. And so he's, he's responding from Antioch. And on to the scene, we have this Archimandrite. Uh, uh, I, I thought I changed that. Uh, a monk at this time was not a priest. A monk at this time was a person that had made a decision to live a separate, secluded life of hunger and poverty and charitable works and, you know, the bad haircuts, the scratchy clothes, the, you know, not brushing your teeth, the whole nine yards. Well, somebody had to be in charge of the monkeries. And the guy in charge of the, the, the monk house uh, was a Archimandrite. That was the term that they got. Well, Eutyches was uh, dim-witted. But he was in charge, and he was looked up to by other monks. And he was in Constantinople. So we've got Alexander, Rhea. We've got Antioch, 
And we've got the new capital of Rome, Constantinople, where we've got this, this chief monk. Well, he is still understanding that there are two natures before the hyperstatic union, but he can't understand how those two natures can continue to exist in one person, Jesus Christ. So what he does is he starts saying that after the incarnation, whatever was divine and whatever was human are are no longer separately divine and human, but they've kind of made this new thing. Which is a problem because if Jesus isn't human, but he's like, you know, blended humanity with divinity, if the, you know, the two aren't still separate, then it wasn't humanity that resisted temptation. It wasn't humanity that suffered and died. It was this new thing. And so again, we're not saved. All goes back to God had to come down and become man for us to be saved. Well, now he's not man anymore. He's this divine man thing. So he used the expression of the humanity of Jesus that it was like a drop of wine in the uh, ocean of the deity of God, right? It basically doesn't matter if uh, dilution is the solution to your problems, right? Like, uh, so the humanity is so overwhelmed and so overtaken by the divinity, it just doesn't matter anymore. And actually, that is the logical conclusion if you were to press Alexandrian theology all the way to its end without going back to what Scripture says about the humanity of Jesus. High hunger, high thirst, right? Jesus wept, these, these emotive reactions that Jesus got angry, right, and drove the, the uh, sellers and money changers out of the temple with whips, right? So, um, so Eutychus couldn't hold that anymore and began to teach that. Now, this is interesting because Eutychus actually agrees with the theology that Dioscorus is teaching in Alexandria, Eutyches is in Constantinople. And this is important to understand because in 448, Dioscorus, who agrees with this theology, gets the bishop of Constantinople, Flavius, Flavian, to condemn a guy that he agrees with. Now, why would you do that? Why would you say you need to kick out this monk because he's teaching heresy when you agree with him? Well, the reason you do that is because you want him to come and get uh, refuge with you in Alexandria so that you can push the point and create this conflict and, 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 and force Antioch to now have to, you know, make a decision. Theodoret's teaching opposite of Dioscorus. Here in this third city, the capital of Rome, we've got this monk teaching things Dioscorus agrees with. Dioscorus gets... Eutyches kicked out, but then he gives him refuge. And so what do you do if you're in Antioch and you're seeing this thing happen is now you've got to say, okay, we got to have a council because what you're doing down there in Alexandria is, you know, out of control. And that's exactly what uh, Dioscorus wants. Well, at this time, Eutyches actually wrote a letter to Leo, who is the bishop of Rome, to try to get the bishop of Rome on Eutyches' side. You can look up on the Christian Classics Ethereal Library website and read the letter Leo wrote back to Eutyches. Um, he basically calls him dim-witted, confused, and heretical. Well, at the same time, Dioscorus, who is the bishop in Alexandria, is using all the wealth of Alexandria to make the theological point to the emperor, Theodosius II, that he's right. He's buying off the power of the Roman government to be on his side. So we've got Eutyches writing to Rome to try to get them to support the Alexandrian view. We've got Dioscorus meddling up in Constantinople to try to force Antioch into agreeing with them, or at least, you know, having this council. And you've got Dioscorus buying off the emperor. So who are the players? Just to keep all this uh, wonderful, it's like uh, one of those mid-afternoon soap operas, right? Like the days of our lives, right? As, as theology through the hourglass flows, these are the days of our lives. Um, the emperor, Theodosius II. 
Next time we gather together, we're going to look at Theodosius the first, but this is the second. We have Dioscorus, who is the Pope of Alexandria. I, you, you need to understand the Pope is not a term exclusive to the Bishop of Rome. It is typically understood that way for Westerners today because we do not live near Eastern Orthodox. But they call the Bishop of Alexandria Pope. They call the Bishop of Constantinople Pope. They call the Bishop of Kiev, Kiev Pope, right? Papa, it just means father. If you were to ever meet the Bishop of Rome, or if I were to ever meet him, I would probably call him Pontifus Maximus because that's a pagan priest title, which I think is actually more appropriate. I'm gonna get in trouble, but... When Don and I visited Rome, we got to tour the Vatican. And they actually give you a discount, because of course you have to pay to see anything Roman Catholic, uh, to, to visit the Vatican. Well, they have a discount for your ticket if you are a clergy member. So when we bought our tickets online, I'm like, yes, of course I'm a clergy. Well, I show up dressed like I'm dressed. And the guy's looking at me, he said, you, he said you're a clergy. I said, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Baptist pastor. He's like, that's not clergy. I can't give you a clergy discount for that because, you know, he's got his little clerical collar. He's a Roman Catholic priest, right? For In their mind, those are the only clergy. I, I still got my discount. Flavian is the, is the Pope of Constantinople, right? He's the head bishop of Constantinople. And we have Leo I, Leo the Great, Pope of Rome, and we have Theodoret of Cyrus, who is the principal theologian of Antioch. And we have this poor monk, dim-witted guy, Eutyches, the monk in the middle. We good? We got all the players down? Because it's going to get spicy. In 449, Dioscorus gets Theodosius II to call a council in Constantinople and appoint Dioscorus, who's the Pope of Alexandria, as the head of the council in Constantinople. Not, not the Pope of Constantinople, Flavian, but Dioscorus. Weird, right? Well, Dioscorus shows up, and he brings with him a bunch of monks from Egypt who are heavily armed with clubs and swords, and he's got a, a, a thug party, right? Like he brought his biker gang with him to... to give him protection and make sure people understood correctly his theology, right? Just like his gold did with the emperor. Well, Flavian then arrives with a letter that Leo had written to him, commonly called Leo's Tome, which was written to the Bishop of Constantinople specifically because his chief monk wrote to the Bishop of Rome saying, am I right here? Is there really a third thing made by the union of humanity and divinity? And Leo wrote back Eutyches, but he also wrote back this lengthy letter to Flavian, the bishop of Constantinople, to, to provide him Leo's opinion about what is the true nature of the union, this hypostatic union. So Flavian has this letter from Leo, Leo's tome, that is in, in opposition to Eutychius, and because Alexandria agrees, it's also in opposition to Dioscorus, who's the head of this council, 449. They're actually, they're meeting in Ephesus, not Constantinople. It's still not Alexandria, so they're meeting in Ephesus. The council is called to order. Eutychius is reinstated. And the Antiochene and Constantinopolian bishops are deposed along with their head um, theologian, Theodoret of Cyrus. Alexandrian bishop Dioscorus is on Eutyches' side. So when he calls to order the council at Ephesus in 449, he puts Eutyches back as the chief monk and says, you're right, the bishop of Constantinople, the bishop of Antioch and their chief theologian are all wrong. They're all deposed. And because we've got the government on our side with Theodosius II, they're also exiled. Well, Flavian, who's the bishop of Constantinople, isn't going to stand for that. So he gets up at this council and he starts to read Leo's tome. 
So Dioscorus unleashes his thugs on him and they literally beat him to death. It took him days to die from the beating he received at a church council. He was the Pope of Constant of the capital of Rome, beaten to death by another bishop's monks. Well, when Leo hears about this, he, he's, he's like, that's not right. This is a robber synod. And that's where the expression comes with. And, um, but, but this whole time, Theodosius II is supporting the decisions made at this synod. Leo wants to call another one in the West without the emperor's support. Because he knows theologically this is wrong. And, and we're going to see as we go back the next time we meet together, which won't be next week because of the church business meeting, but the week after that, that the West really has no emperor authority over it at this time. Right? We saw 410, Alaric had already sacked Rome. Right, The Western part of the empire is pretty much gone as far as the government side. So Leo being now the head of both the government and the church out there, which is another reason Roman Catholicism has such a high view of their um, position because they didn't have any you know, civil government over them. Well, 28 July, 450, God intervenes. Theodosius II is out riding around on his horse. The horse bucks him off. He dies. Well, his sister, Elia Pulcheria, takes her consort, I guess is the right word, Marcion, and makes him the new emperor. She had always been vying for power with her brother, Theodosius II. Now that he is dead, she's basically left in charge, but She's a woman, so she goes and gets her consort to be the new emperor, Marcion. But Marcion is basically just the, just the, 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 the person who's doing the things that Pulcheria really wants done. Well, she convinces him to cooperate with Leo, the bishop of Rome, and call another council, but because... She is an Eastern Empress and Marcion is an Eastern Emperor. They don't want to have this council in the West. Incidentally, at this time, there's a friendly little guy named Attila the Hun who is moving down from, uh, you know, China and Indonesia into Northern Turkey, right? So there's, there's kind of a problem. That's where you have to go through to get between East and West. And Attila the Hun is, is, is running roughshod over that part of the Roman Empire at this time. So they want to have their council in the east. Um, Marcion wanted it to be in the east in addition because the capital of Rome was Constantinople and he did not want Constantinople to be dependent on decisions made at Rome where Leo wanted the council to be. Well, the first thing he, he, he does is he exiles Eutyches to Syria. He says, your problem uh, you need now. Leo didn't want Eutyches to be exiled or anything. Leo understood that um, Eutyches was just deceived and, and not smart enough to understand. But Marcion goes ahead and exiles him. So in 451, they call for a council to be held at Chalcedon, and they ordered every bishop, east and west, to come as the government. Now, not invitations, but orders to bishops to come to this council. At the same time, they're uh, circulating this letter that the Bishop of Rome had written. I'm sure that did nothing for his ego, right? Like, you know, 500 bishops all have to read the thing you wrote as the government's official position on what's going to be discussed at the council you're ordered to go to. But interesting, Leo decided not to go. Now, mostly that was for political and image purposes. Like, I'm, you can't tell me what to do. I'm the Bishop of Rome sort of thing. This is supposed to be in the West, and I don't like that you're holding it at Chalcedon. You're just the emperor. Well, what do you think Dioscorus does when he hears he has to go to a council by this new emperor who disagrees with him? 
Well, he, he sees the, the writing on the wall, right? So he and 10 bishops from Alexandria excommunicate Leo because he's a, a, a contender with God, because he's an antichrist. And they, they depose him as the bishop of Rome and appoint their own man as bishop of Rome from Alexandria. Now, it turns out that didn't stick, but, you know, this is, this is what happened. Well, uh, he actually went, Dioscorus went to Chalcedon and attended the first two sessions, but then after that he cited poor health and did not uh, go to the remaining ones once he realized uh, We'll, we'll read about it. October the 5th, 451. The council's convened. There are 500 bishops. The emperor and empress are there. Uh, the Antiochenes and Westerners are sitting on one side of the great hall. And Dioscorus and his supporters are sitting on the other side of the hall. And what they do is they begin reading out. Uh, well, first thing they do is they, they march in the great theologian of Antioch who had been exiled and excommunicated. Theodosius, Theodoret of Cyrus, which almost caused a riot in this, you know, church meeting. And then they formally anathematized or said, uh, you are excommunicated and wrong, uh, the position of Eutychianism. This idea that there's this new being that's made when the divine and the human come together. Well, after reading out Leo's tome and having a discussion, ultimately Dioscorus is exiled to the desert in Turkey, uh, the city of Gangra, and he's replaced by a new pope in Alexandria, a guy named Proterius. But Dioscorus was loved by many of the churches in Alexandria. I mean, they've got a real hard-charging, you know, vigorous fire and brimstone preaching bishop. They love that guy. They're for that guy. I, I know you can't imagine uh, a, a, a wrong-minded leader who's very charismatic and very nationalistic and you know, very much for their position having a large group of supporters. That's never happened in history, has it? So what happens is they say, no, we're going to continue to follow Dioscorus as Coptic Christians, because Dioscorus is right. There is just one nature after the union of the divine and the holy. Uh, but it isn't a new type of nature. They, they believe in what we're going to see is called miaphysitism, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that here in a second. The only heavy theology part we're going to have is going to come up here in a minute, so strap in. Well, when Dioscorus dies in 454, they're still not recognizing the guy that was appointed at the Council of Chalcedon as their pope, and they appoint another guy, Timothy II. And he was so excited about this that his life was in danger now that he had to flee for his life and, and go into hiding. Like, no, I don't want to be your bishop. I don't want to be your pope. So what, what were the three uh, views of the, the blending of the humanity or the coming together, the union of this hypostatic union? The first was what's called the monophysite, one phusis, one person. This is the Alexandrian view, that the two natures came together into one new essence, one new type of being that is a God-man being. God-man nature. Whatever substance of divinity is there, whatever substance of humanity is there, they become a new substance, monophysitism. Then there's diophysitism. This is that there are two natures that are unified in one person and traits of one can be communicated to the other without changing the nature of one, like the human nature can be immortal because it's redeemed and unified with the divine, which is also why our new you know, body will be immortal because it's redeemed by the divine. But they're not mixed. This was Leo's view. This is what you will read if you go on to the CCEL and you read Leo's tome. This is what you'll read when you read the, for, the, the Chalcedonian definition here in a second. And then there was the Coptic view. 
This is the view they thought Dioscorus was teaching. Now Dioscorus was actually teaching and Eutychius was teaching monophysitism, but they understood Cyril's view, which is Mia physitism, which instead of two natures merged like this, they understood the two natures as being unified like this. That it wasn't just traits or characteristics that went one way or the other that were, you know, but they understood that part of the nature kind of blended with the, of the divine nature blended with the human nature. Part of the human nature blended with the divine nature. So it still has all divine nature, but it's kind of blended together. Think of the uh, peanut butter and grape jelly that's pre-mixed in the jar, right? You can look at both, but when you scoop it out and try to use it, you get, you know, the, the, the two blended together. That's, that's meophysitism, right? Diphysitism is um, the peanut butter sandwich where the, the peanut butter and the jelly came from different jars and you put them together. And, you know, these are not perfect examples. Just bear with me. Monophysitism is if you had stirred the jar together all at once. So what did they conclude at the Council of Chalcedon? How are we doing on time? Yes, Brother Billy. Hey, uh, years ago, there was a big controversy, a radio Bible class. Yeah. Your neck the guy came up and said, Jesus never said that he was the Yeah, so the, the question is, um, just for those who are watching online, um, there was a, a, someone who came on the radio a few years back that made the statement that Jesus could have sinned, although he held that he did not sin. And so the question is, if a person understands that to be true, that in his humanity he could have sinned, but in his divinity he did not, and because of his divinity, his humanity did not sin, um, by coming down on the wrong side of that, would that person be a heretic? Well, the answer is, I believe, if you are shown biblically where your position does not agree with the statements made in Scripture. Scripture is clear. Jesus was tempted and he is like us in every way except without sin. Does not say without the possibility of sin or without the potential to sin. Our human nature, when we are redeemed, living in the uh, new flesh, will not sin by our choice. And we will not have the temptation of the world, of the devil, and of fallen flesh to sin. Could we, in that new heaven and new earth, in that redeemed flesh, could we sin? Theoretically, but we won't. Because we will be in the immediate presence of Christ and, and the glory of God with us. So I believe that the nature of Jesus experienced that same close connection with the divine and did not sin, even though theoretically he was fully human. And theoretically that temptation was a real temptation. I would not go so far, though, to say that he could sin in his humanity. I, I understand that's a fence-sitting position, but I think there's mystery there that we cannot get too direct on. One of his arguments was that he had the nature of Adam and Eve, but he didn't have the nature of the fall. Yes. But yet Adam and Eve still could. And did. And did. So. Right. And they were tempted by the devil, and Jesus was tempted by the devil, and Paul makes it clear that Jesus is the new Adam. Just as in one man all humanity sins, so in one man all humanity is redeemed. So I think that argument is correct, but I wouldn't go so far as to say that he could sin as in actually would sin. 
right? That, that, that he does not have the same potential to commit sin as uh, Adam and Eve did. Because he is God himself. Adam and Eve were not God themselves, right? When the serpent approached Eve, evidently she did not have the presence of God immediately with her. Jesus actually is God, right? So, so yes, I believe his humanity at Chalcedon. And this, is our, our, the, this definition is the last bit of the class that we have for today. And then we can go for any more questions. In agreement, therefore... With the Holy Fathers, we all, this was signed, by the way, by all the bishops and the emperor and empress. Uh, we all unanimously teach that we should confess that our Lord Jesus Christ is one and the same Son, the same perfect in Godhead and the same perfect in manhood, truly God and truly man, the same of a rational soul and body. Now, this is saying that the human will that Jesus had was a reasonable human will. It had the, you know, the urge, the essence, the, you know, of all humanity. It wasn't a, uh, a God and a Bob theology, and it wasn't two separate persons who were just united in pur- purpose. Consubstantial, that means sharing with the same substance, because it is the same substance as the Father in the, in the Godhead, and the same consubstantial with us in manhood meaning he had real human flesh, like us in all things except sin, begotten of the Father before all ages as regards his Godhead, and which meant his human beingness had a specific moment in time when it came to be, but is now forever immortal. And in the last days, that is the days of the church, the same for us and for our salvation, begotten of the Virgin Mary, the God-bearer, right? The Theotokos, as regards his manhood, meaning from the moment of conception, he was already eternally God in the womb. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, Kurios, that's the title of of, uh, Godness, only begotten. And then what I put in yellow are often called the four fences of Chalcedon, because what they do is they limit language that, that you can use to describe God, they, or or the person of Jesus. They put fences around the mystery. They say, you can explain things up to this point, but when you get to this point, you cannot go further in your description without crossing into heresy. Made known in two natures, and here they are, without confusion. That's that meophysitism that, uh, with, without change, without division, and without separation. So you can't confuse them. You can't change one nature or the other. You can't divide them. You can't take them apart. And you can't separate them. Division and separation seem like the same uh, word in English to us. But they, they do have slightly um, distinctions. Division is being able to say uh, one is um, pulled apart from the other. Separation is then to discuss it apart from the other. Yes, Brother Billy. At this, at this time, did the Roman Catholic Church believe that the bread of communion was the body of Christ? So, the, the, the church at large had people teaching that there was a mystery. Ambrose is a guy we're going to look at who holds that there is something mystical about the communion that transfers the grace of God to our humanity and affects in us sanctification because it is somehow divine. That would get clarified more by his successor, Augustine, who would use Aristotle's view of the world, that there's, for, that there's forms and, and there's the, the external thing that you see Right, an acorn has the form of an oak tree within it. So when you plant it, it becomes an oak tree because all along, even though it looks like an acorn, it tastes like a nut, right? Um, so that's what Augustine is going to say about the communion. So yes, that view, but they also believe that baptism was effectual at washing away sins, right? So, so they had wrong views on, on how the church should be organized, on baptism. They, uh, we're going to see again when we look at Ambrose, and, and really starting with um, um, the guy from Carthage. 
about the uh, Nestorianism. Uh, not Cyril of Carthage. Uh, he, he had the idea of doing penance rather than repenting for people who had, had committed some of the major sins, right? Adultery, apostasy, or murder were the three big sins. Um, and if you committed one of those, you could never be readmitted to communion with the church unless you had done sufficient penance. Penance meant you stood outside of the church door on Sunday morning as the church came in in sackcloth and ashes and you confessed your sin to everybody that came in. So, you know, if you committed adultery, you'd be out there in your sackcloth and had everybody that came in for years, you would say, I'm so-and-so, like an Alcoholics Anonymous thing, I'm an adulterer, right? Or I'm a murderer or I'm a, uh, I, 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 I'm apostate. I, I declared my faith was not true under threat of torture or whatever it was. So uh, these are the four fences. Um, there is a thing, there's a movement in theology today. There's two movements in theology today that I think are alarming. One is what they call anhypostatic theology, which is to consider the humanity of God and the divinity of God apart from the other component. If, if they were not together, what would the humanity of Christ be? And, and part of that theology is what you're discussing. Could that have sinned? Well, that immediately goes against here. You can't separate the natures. They have to be thought of as unified once the incarnation happened. You can't separate them. You can't actually divide them. You can't, you know, when, the, when Jesus dies on the cross, you can't say that the divinity left. But you also can't say that the Father was on the cross. It was the Son that was on the cross. So that's the division part. The separation is considering them separately. The second movement is what's called the eternal functional subordination of the Son. Theologians are awesome. <laughs> EFS for short. EFS, the eternal functional subordination. And what this is, is this actually comes out of the uh, egalitarian and complementarian debate in the church. And the complementarians, the orthodox guys, are saying that because marriage is a picture of God and Christ, the Father and the Son, that it must be that there is something eternal about the person, about the nature of Jesus that makes him subordinate to the Father. And there's two things that are at risk here. One, the sonship of Jesus is a description of relationship, not of being. And EFS theology begins to discuss the being of God as a, as a uh, necessary component of the function of God. Somehow that, and the second thing is, is they're using human institu institutions to describe the Trinity, instead of using the Trinity to describe human institutions. It's, it's backwards thinking. So, uh, four fences. The difference of the natures being by no means removed because of the union, but the property of each nature being preserved and coalescing in one person, prosopone, and one being, hypostases, not parted, or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, only begotten, divine word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets of old and Jesus Christ himself have taught us about him. And the creed of our fathers has handed down. Now, if you do not have a perfect understanding of the Chalcedonian definition, you are not a heretic. You're a heretic if you believe something that is contradictory to what the Bible says, and in spite of all the teaching that you get, you stand opposed to your teachers, the elders God has appointed in the church, and you stand opposed to them and believe wrongly. That, you know, you don't wake up, oh, I'm a heretic, you know? Like, that's not how, you know, this, this is something. And, and, and almost every time these guys think that they're doing something good for the church, that they're clarifying a mystery of the church, that they, they've got this new insight. Oh, this prophecy is fulfilled by, you know, this new thing and nobody's ever realized it before in the, the history of the church. And in spite of everybody who you run into saying, no, that, that makes Jesus now uh, a lesser being because he's not the fulfillment of that prophecy. Like the Bible says he is. 
right? Or, or uh, the being of, of humanity needs to be redeemed by our works somehow to escape the wrath of God, denying Jesus came in the flesh. These are things that, you know, when you persist in those, you become a heretic. And, and eventually, you know, the, the Bible talks about not fellowshipping with antichrists and heretics and, and um, you know, don't answer a fool according to his folly comes after answering a fool according to his folly, right, in the wisdom literature. Because you try, but like what they had to do here, eventually these guys just, ref- you know, uh, uh, Dioscorus just refuses to come to a proper understanding of the nature of Jesus, united divinity and humanity, refuses, right? And is manipulating other churches. And, and so eventually you have to just excommunicate them, right? Paul and Timothy, stay away from people who are idle, you know, words, endless geolo- genealogies, you know, it doesn't have to just be genealogies, could be, you know, any pointless thing like that that you follow. So, so there we have it, Chalcedon. Next week, church business meeting. The week after that, we're going to look at Ambrose of Milan and um, Theodor- Theodosius I and Jerome. And it'll be more like this, like events that happen in the church with a lot less of the, you know, Ephesus too. We shouldn't see, I mean, we're going to see a lot of people get murdered then, but they won't be at a church council. So stay tuned. Any other questions? Thank you for joining us. Look forward to seeing you at the business meeting.